Hello Internet! Today we are going to explore the vertex algebra of one free boson. If you know my channel, you may be looking forward to the next episode in my series on quantum mechanics. And this episode will come out. I just cannot promise a date yet. In the meantime, and to keep up my motivation, I decided to try something a bit different with lower production value, but also with a very interesting topic. And that's when I came across a video by Michael Penn. Michael has a great mathematics channel on YouTube and he has been making some videos about vertex operator algebras, which are highly interesting objects that come up both in physics and in mathematics and that create interesting connections between different areas. The particular video I am referring to is Michael's video about the Heisenberg algebra. In this video, Michael presents the abstract definition of a vertex algebra and then proceeds to present one particular construction that is called the vertex algebra of one free boson. Before he goes into the details, he puts up a specific challenge, namely this one. Physics YouTubers make a video explaining how this models one free boson. And that is exactly what we are going to start to do in this video. In the following, I will assume that you have seen Michael's video, although later in our discussion we will repeat many of the steps that he goes through. The construction that Michael presents is quite abstract, and at first sight it's not at all clear what it has to do with the physical description of one free boson. But what does one free boson mean anyway? You might be thinking of a particle like the Higgs boson. And you might think that what is meant is a theory about one such particle. But that's not quite right. It turns out that quantum mechanics, when you combine it with the theory of special relativity, is only consistent for theories that take the creation and annihilation of particles into account. So you cannot have a fixed number a non-zero fixed number of particles. Quantum theories that can do this are called quantum field theories. So what we are really looking at is the theory of one bosonic quantum field. Well, bosonic means that the particles that this field describes obey the so-called Bose-Einstein statistics. This means that all of these particles will be identical, they will be indistinguishable, and furthermore, you can have multiple of these particles in the same quantum state. Also, the particles we will be looking at will be much simpler than the real-world Higgs boson, because we are looking at a free quantum field. That means that the particles are not interacting with each other or with other particles. We are looking at a non-interacting bosonic quantum field. If you are not sure what all this is supposed to mean, don't worry, we will later unpack all of this jargon very carefully and slowly, but first I would like to give you a short preview of how the description of a quantum field will align with the construction that Michael presents in his video. He starts with a one-dimensional vector space and uh, this corresponds to the quantum field that we are looking at having only one component. In particular, this field will have no polarization or directionality to it. Uh, then Michael constructs the so-called affinization of this vector space seen as a Lie algebra. And this step corresponds to looking at the modes of oscillation of the quantum field. 
So these objects that are indexed by an integer will correspond to the so-called modes of our quantum field. The commutation relation that he specifies, this one here, is the quantization condition for the field. So this relation is the reason for all the specific quantum behavior that we will see. Michael then proceeds with the construction by specifying a particularly simple one-dimensional representation of a part of the algebra of, of modes of the field. And this one-dimensional representation corresponds to what phys physicists call the vacuum. That is the lowest energy state of the theory, the state in which we know that there are no particles around. Starting from this vacuum, the next step in the construction uh, builds up a vector space. Oh, this vector space is in physics known as the Fox space. Example states that Michael presents correspond to states of um, known number of particles with known momenta. To conclude this preview, let's look at the general definition of a vertex algebra and how it corresponds to the physical interpretation. First, a vertex algebra is a vector superspace, so actually for the boson a vector space will be sufficient. And this vector space is in general the space of quantum states, so the Hilbert space of quantum states. Then these formal power series will correspond to the mode expansion of local operators. And the map y from the vertex algebra to these formal power series expresses a very important property called the state operator correspondence. Therefore, every state v, we get a local operator that is given here in form of its mode expansion. Regarding the axioms, the first one, or the first group of axioms, is about the properties of the vacuum. So this is about annihilating the vacuum and creating particle states from the vacuum. This, the second axiom here, this is about a translation or translations in space and time of these local operators. And the final axiom that Michael wrote down in two equivalent forms here, this is a very important locality property as we will see. Locality refers to the fact that uh, these operators are localized in space and time in a precise sense that we will talk about. Okay, I hope you are still with me after this horrible amount of jargon, because we will now switch gears and begin to make our way very slowly through the topics I mentioned. The first important questions are, 
what is a field and what are the modes of a field. The word field means completely different things in mathematics and physics. In physics, a field is a quantity that can in principle be observed at every point in space at every point in time. More precisely speaking, a field, let's call it phi, is a family of observables, which is short for observable quantities, that is indexed by space and time. So for every point in space x and every time t, phi of x and t is an observable. To give you an example of a field, you can think of the electric field. However, the electric field is somewhat more complicated than the field we will be looking at because the electric field has multiple components. At every point in space and at every time you can measure the electric field and it will not only have a magnitude but also a direction. So in three-dimensional space, for example, you would have three components of the electric field at any particular point at any particular time. We could call them E1, E2 and E3 of X and T. The field we will be using is simpler in that it will have only a single component phi at each point in space and time. Actually, what I just told you is a slight simplification because there are fields in physics which are not directly observable quantities. Rather, they are kind of the smallest building blocks of observable quantities. However, in the simplest cases, like the one we will be looking at, we can directly think of the field itself as an observable quantity. So physically, we think of our field phi as something that can be measured for every point in space x and every time t. Although we will see later that the idea of uh, measuring a field at a mathematically precise point x in space and t in time is somewhat too naive and will have to be qualified. But what kind of mathematical object is this phi in our theory? That depends upon which theoretical framework we are using. And as is quite common in physics, we will be switching between two important theoretical frameworks in our discussion, namely the framework of classical physics and the framework of quantum physics. Only quantum physics can be expected to give us a physically correct description. However, classical physics is still often useful because it is simpler and in some cases it can at least give us an, an approximate idea how the physical system is going to behave. We have not yet talked about what we actually get when we observe our field at a point in space and time. Let's define our field phi to be real valued. That means whenever we measure phi at x and t, we get a particular real number as the result. In order to build a mathematical model, we will also need a precise way to specify points in space and time. We will do this by using a coordinate system that allows us to specify points in space and time by giving a list of real numbers. We will express time as a single real number and we will use one dimensional space only so we'll also express the location in space by a single real number. So how can we model our field mathematically in the framework of classical physics?
Classical physics is built on the assumption that we can, in principle, know all observables simultaneously. This means that if we know everything, phi for each point x t would just be a specific real number. This is the case for all x t in R cross R, which is our space-time manifold. In other words, phi is just a function from space and time to the real numbers mapping each point in space and time to the value of the field at that point. But what if we don't know everything? In that case, it is common to treat phi simply as an a priori unknown function of this type. This is not the most formally precise way to put it, but it will suffice for our purposes. The mathematical description of our field in the framework of quantum mechanics is an entirely different story, and we will talk about that later. You may be wondering why we are content with restricting our field to one spatial dimension. After all, that's not what we are used to from the real world. Actually, we are going to restrict space even more by demanding that our field be periodic in the spatial dimension. To state this precisely, we will fix a constant L positive and demand that phi of x plus l at a time t be equal to phi at x and t for all x in the real numbers. When you look at a space-time diagram, this demand is essentially equivalent to identifying, for example, this line here at x equals zero with a line at x equals l. So that the points in space-time here are actually the same as these points. And overall, this identification is the same as wrapping our space dimension along a compact circle. So the topology of our space-time will look like the following. Space at any given time will look like a compact, compact circle of circumference L. Time is unchanged, so it is still has still infinite extent. So our whole overall space time will look like an infinite cylinder stretching in the time direction. Why might we want to do such a strange thing? Uh, well, the boring answer is that this removes some technical difficulties from the field theory and also it is necessary to ultimately end up with the algebra of discrete modes that Michael presents in his video. But a much more exciting answer is that this situation is exactly one in which we end up in string theory when we are describing the motion of a closed string through space-time. In that case, you can imagine this cylinder as 
the so-called word sheet of a string that the string is swiping out uh, while it is moving through uh, space and time. And in this case, the coordinates x and t are actually just arbitrary but well-chosen coordinates on the string word sheet and are dimensionless. A further discussion of string theory would go beyond the scope of uh, the, this video. But if you want to learn more about it, please tell me in the comments and maybe we can um, make videos about that too. Anyway, for the purpose of this discussion, I will continue to call x the space coordinate and t the time coordinate. I want to emphasize that this identification is really an identification of observables and as such it will be valid in both the classical framework and the quantum framework. We are now done with the kinematics of our theory, that is we have defined the independent degrees of freedom in terms of observables and we could immediately proceed to look at the modes of the field and how they are defined. However, in order to better motivate why we would want to look at individual modes of oscillation of our field, let's first take a look at the dynamics of our theory. That is, how field configurations are going to change with time. We will specify the dynamics of our field by giving it so-called action. The action is a mathematical function that is an important starting point for both the classical and the quantum description. But first we will look at it from the classical point of view. The action, let's denote it by the letter S, is a function that is calculated given two points in time, let's call them T1 and T2. And let's note them here. So uh, the action for this time interval is defined as an integral over time. Going from t1 to t2 of another function, namely the so-called Lagrangian function, which is denoted by L. And as is usual in the physics literature, I will write the measures of integrals close to the integral sign, and also I will usually omit all the arguments from functions, because otherwise the notation quickly becomes unwieldy. The Lagrangian function, in turn, is for a field theory, again defined as an integral, this time over space. So, uh, if we plug that in for the action, we get that it's an integral over time from t1 to t2 of an integral over space, integral dx, and this is understood to go over the full spatial dimension, which in our case is compact. So, we don't get a problem integrating over the circle because it has a well-defined circumference L. Um, and what is the integrand? This is uh, a function that is denoted by script L and is called the Lagrangian density of the theory. Postulating a certain Lagrangian density is a very compact way to specify the dynamics of a field theory. And even for complicated field theories like the standard model of particle physics that describes all the known particles in our universe, this Lagrangian density can be made to fit on a t-shirt in compact notation. For um, a classical field theory, the Lagrangian density completely defines the field theory while for a quantum field theory, there is a little bit more work that you have to uh, do to make the theory well-defined. 
So what is the Lagrangian density in the case of our free boson? It is indeed very simple. The Lagrangian density is T over 2 times first partial derivative of phi with respect to time squared minus the first partial derivative of phi with respect to space squared, where t is a constant that is included for the full expression to make dimensional sense. I should note that from now on we will be using so-called natural units, that is, we will choose our units of measurements such that the physical constants h-bar and which is the reduced uh, Planck's quantum of action and c which is the vacuum speed of light will both be dimensionless quantities equal to one and in these natural units this is the Lagrangian density of our free boson where t is a constant, the dimensions of which depend on the context in which we are specifying our theory. So if we view it as a standalone quantum field theory, t is dimensionless and will usually be set to 1. In the context of string theory, t has dimensions of length to the negative second power and is called a string tension in string theory. So how do these definitions fix the dynamics of our field in the classical framework? They do it by the so-called principle of stationary action. This principle states that given the configuration of the field at two points in time, T1 and T2, the change of values of the field between these points in time will be such that any slight variation to the trajectory of the field values in this region that leaves the endpoints fixed will not change the action to first order. So this is often written by delta s equals zero. Delta s is called the variation of the action and it is the first order change of this action integral as the values of the field phi over time are varied. And this vanishing of the variation of the action is only postulated for variations that leave the field configurations at the endpoints in time t1 and t2 fixed. So we should state that delta s is zero for variations of phi such that phi x at time one is equal to a fixed given function phi 1 of x for all x and phi at x at time 2 is equal to another given function phi 2 of x for all x. Unfortunately, we don't have the time right now to go deeper into this very strange but also very powerful principle. 
and we will just use standard techniques in the following uh, that you can look up in textbooks on classical field theory for deriving the equations of motion of our field from this Lagrangian density. The standard techniques say that you get the equation of motion as follows, namely the time derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the time derivative of the field plus the spatial derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the spatial derivative of the field is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field. This strange notation simply means that the partial derivatives of phi with respect to t and with respect to x are simply treated as variables here on which the Lagrangian density is allowed to depend. It also is allowed to depend on the field value directly, which, as you notice, it doesn't do in our particular case. If you want to look this equation up, it is called the Euler-Lagrange equation. So let's plug our specific Lagrangian for the free boson into the generic Euler-Lagrange equation to get the equations of motion for the free boson. So here we have the time derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to d phi by dt. We see here d phi by dt appears as the square, so we just uh, use the normal rules of differentiation to get that this is this derivative here is t over 2 times 2 times from the exponent uh, and d phi by dt. Okay, that's this part here plus the spatial derivative of this thing. So this is the derivative of this function with respect to uh, this here regarded as a independent variable. In this case we get minus from here, minus t over 2. partial of phi with respect to x equals the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field value itself, which is zero in our case because our Lagrangian density does not depend directly on the field value. Okay, so um, I forgot the two here. We can actually cancel these twos. We can divide the whole equation by the constant, non-zero constant t. And what we get in the end, if we uh, apply this partial time derivative here to this and this partial space derivative to this, is that the second partial time derivative of phi d phi by dt squared minus second partial derivative of d phi by dx squared equals zero. This is the equation of motion of our bosonic field derived in the framework of classical physics. Now that we have got this very simple and very beautiful equation of motion for our bosonic field, let's get some intuition for what it means. We can, of course, put this equation into the form 
second partial derivative of phi with respect to time is equal to the second partial derivative of phi with respect to space. And this is valid for all x and t in our space-time r cross r. So let's think about what this means for some example field configuration that I have drawn here. So in this case we have space on the horizontal axis and now we have not time but we have the field value as the vertical axis for this graph. And for example, if we look at a section like this, that is kind of bent downwards. So here the second derivative with respect to x will be negative and therefore also the second derivative with respect to time will be negative. So here we will have that the second time derivative is negative. In contrast here where the graph is bent upwards like this we will have the second derivative with respect to time being positive and so on. So here it's also negative, actually more strongly negative than here because it's bent more strongly. Uh, and <clears throat> if you think about what the second derivative with, with respect to time means, it is kind of an acceleration of the field value with time. So how the rate of change of the field value with time will change with time. And this means that here in this section where we have this kind of wave crest, uh, the acceleration will be negative. So it will go downwards to more negative field values also here. And in this section, the field will accelerate um, upwards towards higher phi values. And this is really exactly how we intuitively uh, expect a kind of rubber band or, or spring to behave, uh, that it is accelerated downwards when the neighboring pieces of the string, so to speak, pull it downward and vice versa. Such considerations lead us to expect that field configurations which have particularly simple second spatial derivatives like such a sine wave will have also particularly simple behavior in time. And that is ex exactly the idea behind the mode expansion of a field that we will look at next. We will be expressing the field in terms of sine and cosine functions and we will find that these contributions of sines and cosines have particularly simple behavior with time. Okay, let's continue with this in the next part. If you have any questions so far, please put them in the comments below so I can answer them. If you like this video, please comment and subscribe. And if you want to see more of this kind of videos in the future, consider supporting me on Subscribestar. You can find all the links in the description below. See you next time.